and it start the program. So thank you again for joining us for tonight's virtual academy, the great unforgettable forgotten history quiz with Ephrata's museum educator, Michael Showalter and the Ephrata Cloister student historians. Michael, students, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. And thank you everyone for joining us here this evening. As Elizabeth mentioned, tonight's program is going to be very different from our previous uh, virtual academy programs. While it will contain a uh, history and lots of facts, we also want to mix in a lot of fun. We want you to chime in with any kinds of comments, stories, uh, recipes, songs, whatever you got that might be pertinent to the questions. We're gonna be asking a bunch of questions. We're gonna ask you to use the chat box to just put in the question, the answer to the question as we ask it. And then after that, the students will be providing sort of the, the real answer or more about the answer. And when they've finished with their short presentation, then we'll come back and say, what else would you like to chime in about? So with all of that presented, oh, let me say also, Many of you might recognize a few of these student stories. This is how they usually appear at the site as part of the Lantern Tours, the annual program that they are always so well excited about. But this uh, game show tonight uh, was really a, an exciting way to tie in their talents and also their creativity and education. The students came up with the questions for tonight's program and they also researched the answers that they will be providing. And so with all of that, it's time to get ready for the great unforgotten, forgotten history quiz. With your host, Wes Lockard. Hey everyone, welcome to the great unforgotten history quiz. So today you might not know like any of the answers, but that's okay because you're gonna learn a lot. So um who who was the first person who was in the room? We gotta figure that and out. Jolene. That was Jolene Newcomer. Okay, so the way that this game is going to work is um, that person will pick a number and we'll start with that question. I will read off the question. Um, you have a little bit of time to put in what you think is the answer. Then we will reveal the real answer or more to the answer. And once we're done with that, you're allowed to unmute or text anything you want to add, any question, more questions to the, the answer or anything like stories they have. You have both the answer. Okay, and then so whoever answers first will get to choose the next question. But that the, doesn't mean don't rush. Just uh and before excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm still having a small technical issue. I can no longer see the chat box. Can you give me a little clue here because I got to see the chat box. I will monitor it, um, Michael, if you want. Okay. All right. Well, there, okay. There's going to be a lot of coming in. All right. All right. Very um, good. But if you click on the chat, you should be able but to. But I don't, I don't have that option. Option. Okay. I, I don't know if I've if, covered it up, but. One of the students. Go, if you're looking at your bar and yeah. you look at the three dots at the very far right. Yeah. One of those. If oh, I got that, it. I got it. There you go. Thank you. Okay. I, am, I am so sorry. Thank you so much. I apologize, folks. COVID is a learning experience for us all. Do you and want to have jo Jolene go ahead and pick a number? Yep. She can Jolene, unmute herself. Go ahead. You get the first question, Jolene, pick a number. Okay, we'll go with number seven. Number seven. So, which of these four towns do not exist today? Is it Zor, 
La Hoy, New Design, or Cross Key? Okay, type your answers in the chat. Good luck. Okay, we're gonna stop collecting answers here and let me tell you what's come in. Uh, Linda says new design, uh, David says cross keys. Uh, who else we've got here? Charlie uh, says La Hoy, and Suzanne says new design. Uh, ben B says cross keys. Sharon says new design. David Fuchs says new design. Uh, Jolene Newcomer says, new design. Ralph says La Hoy. All right. Wes, that's all that's come in. Oh, I think some of you may have got the answer, but this is the real answer. Oh, oh, oh. It's the real answer if I don't mess this up. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Slide seven, and the real answer is also Michael. There's like a black like box. Um, it was inhabited by the Nanakoke Indians, who were only there. I'm gonna I'm gonna start that over again for you. So the city that's no longer standing is La Hoy. Um, it was inhabited by the Nanakoke Indians, who were only there. Yeah. There for four to five years in the 1750s, um, the log cabin restaurant lies in the middle of where La Hoy would have been. And were you all able to hear that? We were having some technical issues with sound this afternoon. So before we get too far in, just want to make There's sure you get block, like blocking it. I don't know where to put the chat box. Okay. Was the sound okay for everyone? Jolene says she could hear. Good, okay. And Elizabeth, I guess you have to monitor the chat box because okay. I'm afraid I can't get it onto the screen and still be able to see things. I'm sorry. No, I that's fine, I, I can, I can folks, do that. I apologize folks and I appreciate your patience. As I say, we're all still learning and this is a very complicated program as you'll see time going on here. So, did you all cap that? La Hoy is the one that's the town no longer existing. Wes? All right, so does anyone want to share anything? Do you have any more questions about like the actual history behind this? I'm guessing not. So the first yeah, person... Yeah. The first person that got the, the uh, correct answer, which was La Hoy, was Charlie Peters. So Charlie, you get to um oh, wait, we actually the... got we actually got a question here. Oh, okay. Um the, the history behind La Hoy, I guess, and where is new design? Let me see if I can't get back to it. Um so La Hoy. And the other local community of Native Americans was located at Indian Town in Clay Township, uh, just north of Ephrata. Those two communities were inhabited at roughly the same time, around 1750 or so. And they were there for about four years, uh, maybe five years, around 1750. They were all Nanticoke Indians. The Nanticoke were somewhat of a migratory group early in their history, uh, kind of moving often between the Chesapeake Bay in the summertime 
and uh, sort of following animals to the center of Pennsylvania region uh, in the fall and winter time. But by the 1740s, when they settled, much of both areas had been uh, dominated by European settlement. And they did eventually move further to the north and the west in Pennsylvania. Now, I have, oh, you may not be seeing this. Hang on, you're not seeing this. Oh, wait a minute. Nope. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't. You need to start, you need to do the slideshow from this slide. Well, I need to share the screen. That's it, you're not seeing the. No, we, we are seeing the screen. Oh, you are seeing, oh, good, good. Okay, yeah, I think you're yeah. seeing the screen, very you good. You just need to okay. start so, the slideshow So there you can here. see that New Design is an early name for New Holland. Uh, Earl Town is another name that was used early in the 18th century. New Design is a little bit more 19th century. And Cross Keys is the current village of Intercourse. And Zor is Reamstown. And then we have one other question. Was the log cabin built while it was still La Jolla? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. All right. Now the bugs worked out. Now we'll go back to the beginning. Now somebody gets to pick a number. Um, seven is, seven where is was I? It was Charlie Peters gets to pick a number. Great, Charlie, do you, you want to unmute and pick a number? Three, please. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Number three. Question number three. Who started the French and Indian War? We have two guesses of Britain. We've got one of George Washington. Don't be shy, folks. We have another Washington. We could tie two Britons, two Washingtons. Yeah, don't be scared to share your answer because I. Literally all these questions, I, I didn't know before either. But it sounds like we've got what we're going to get maybe for this time. So Wes, why don't you help us out here? So the real answer is actually. Oh, oh. I apologize, folks. Can't tell you how many times I practiced this. That was number three. So you all have been asked, who started the French and Indian War? And the answer, George Washington, during an event known as the Jumonville Affair. So on May 28th of 1754 in southwestern Pennsylvania, George Washington with his Virginia regiment, a group of Ohio Iroquois, Led by Tanya K. Rizon, which means half king, moved towards the camp of Joseph Colon de Humonville, the French ensign. At this time, George Washington was only 22 years old, a lieutenant colonel of a Virginia regiment that had never seen heavy combat or even active combat at all. For that reason, since he was unexperienced, he was heavily mentored by Tan Tanya K. Rizon. They engaged with Humanville and his men, killing both Humanville and several of his soldiers, taking the others prisoner. Now, it is unknown who actually fired the first shot, but some reports say it was Washington himself. For that reason, afterwards, the French government accused Washington of an unprovoked attack during a time of peace on a diplomatic camp. Now, Washington claimed that he was justified in his attack because it was not actually a diplomatic mission, but rather a military operation. Washington's attack on the French camp angered the French government and caused a retaliation attack on Fort Necessary, where Washington and his soldiers were lodged. 
Now, this attack was a huge tactical loss for Washington, as the French Huron, Audra, and Iroquois soldiers overwhelmed his Virginia regiment and forced Washington to surrender. This event spiraled into an international war, known as the Seven Year War, between the British and French empires, and the French were allied with their Native American allies. So that is how George Washington, in a small attack on a French camp, inadvertently sparked a world war between the French and English empires. Wes? All right, so anyone have any more questions about this? Anything they want to add? I'll give you a few seconds and if not, we'll move on to the next question. Looks like Ben B will be able to pick the next number. Actually, Linda Guyman got the question right. The first one to get the question right. Oh, or do, oh yeah, I should add things. So Linda, you can unmute yourself and get ready to pick the next question. It doesn't look like we're getting any. Two. All right. So the question is, name one difference between a Conestoga wagon and a prairie schooner. Getting some answers. Charlie says size. Ben said one was longer and covered. Marietta says the schooner went out west. Terry also says size. Linda said Conestoga wagon hauled freight and the schooner hauled people and went west. Well, I guess that's what we've got right now. West. Conestoga is larger. Conestoga wagon didn't go out west. The bend in the bed of the wagon. I'll give it five more seconds. <laughs> so we got some late one. Okay, I think that's good. That's some good answers. The real answer is It's a common misconception that Conestoga wagons were used by settlers going west on the Oregon Trail. The truth is that they weren't. The wagons used by settlers, collectively dubbed prairie schooners, were mostly just repurposed farm wagons. Conestoga wagons, on the other hand, were highly specialized vehicles whose design was not fitted for crossing the American wilderness. These wagons were built to transport large quantities of goods, up to five or six tons at a time, these were the tractor trailer trucks of the day. There are several features that set it apart from other wagons. The bed, which could be as long as 18 feet, curves up at the front and the back to prevent cargo from moving around on bumpy roads. There is no seat on the wagon as it is not meant to be ridden. The driver either walked beside the wagon or stood on a special pullout board between the left wheels called a lazy board. Because of this, the brake lever is on the back left wheel. A feed box would also hang from the back of the wagon for the horses. I want to thank the Schwenkfeld Library and Heritage Center for allowing me to share the front of the wagon. Any other? Do we got any more questions, comments? Um, and I don't, I don't think we do. I'm not, can't. Okay. Uh, 
Anything else? Marietta, you will get to pick the next one if you want to unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? Sure. Yes. Okay, let's see. I'll pick number, number six. Oh, I'm sorry. That was the one that I wasn't able to get the, the button erased. Let's see if we can go back and hang on. Now I'm, now I'm, oh folks, I'm so sorry. Six, six, seven, and three, I know we've taken. Oh, okay. Well then how about number one? Wes? Okay, so question is, what is the meaning of the stone and why is it here? Do we have any answers? Yeah, we got we got a lot of the same ones. Oh, Actually, good. A lot of mile markers. Why don't you share that with us? All right. So seems like a lot of you said mile markers, and yeah, you are you are very correct. Um. So this stone that you can see on the screen is actually it's located between Giant and the Walmart shopping centers. It's one, of, it's one of many that exist in this area. These stones are a set of mile markers that ran along the DEH Turnpike, which started in Harrisburg and ended in Downingtown. You may know this route as the Paxton Road, and each marker is exactly one mile apart. The markers read XX to P or XX to T, and the P stands for Philadelphia, and the T standing for Turnpike. In effort of their five mar markers existing, one in between Walmart and Giants, which is that one. And there is a missing one that would be located in front of Lee's camera center. There's one across from the Cloister. There's one in Lincoln, one in front of Ace Hardware Store. And the final one is at Twin Pine Car Dealership and Weaver's Candy. On the 9th of September, 1871, this section of the turnpike was condemned for being dangerous and out of repair. This was later owned by the Clay and Hinkletown Turnpike Company, who implemented a toll system from September, 1884 until May, 1919. On July, 1919, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania bought the road and removed the tolls. So good, you got you actually guys got it all right. It's one of those interesting things you would see in town, but you don't really know what it is. Well, actually, most of you knew didn't know what it was. Oh, hang on. Anything else you want to say before we move on to the next question? All right, Ben B had the first right answer. So if Ben, you want to unmute yourself and pick a pick a number. Number 10. Okay, oh. number 10, you Michael. Know, okay, yep, yep. I'm sorry. There we go. Wes? Where are the footprints on the ceiling at the cloister? And how did they get there?
I think you've stumped them. Uh. <laughs> Ben has said church and as a prank. Anybody else have any ideas? This one's very tricky. Ah, we have in the kitchen from a squirrel, in the zall, and on before they were put up. All right, I'll give about 10 more seconds and then we'll reveal the answer. It's all from someone walking across the boards on the ground. Greasy feet. Okay, well, you think that's a good amount of time for everyone? I think so. Okay, so the real answer is it is located on the Zoll ceiling planks, just like you see in the picture. Now, back in the day, many people used to believe that the footprints appeared by some by someone being so moved by the power of God that they were able to walk on the ceiling and their footprints were marked into the ceiling boards to show how power, powerful that God could be. But that, of course, was a myth and that never happened. And the real story is that some of the brothers and sisters of the cloister were mostly barefoot and sometimes they would put grease on their feet just like when we would put on chapstick. One of the children with grease on their feet was walking on one of the boards when they were laying on the ground. The grease soaked into the planks and it left a permanent mark when they were put in and coated with a darker color. But now the footprints have dramatically faded since the restoration in 1969 let in a lot more light. So, I think I stumped some people. Um, would anyone else like to ask any more questions or anything? Or should we move on to the next one? Who who we say that got the correct one? First. Jolene was the first one to get it right, but she started us off. How about Sue Fisher, who was the second one to get it right? Sue, do you want to unmute and pick one? Okay. How about number nine? Number nine. Where is the oldest surviving house in Ephrata? Oh, and for the extra question, I believe you can see them barely. Is that correct, Michael? Yes, they're very hard to see today, but if you know exactly where to look, you can see those footprints. But let's go back to this old house. Is this at the cloister or in the town of Ephrata that you mean? In Ephrata. So the whole town. The whole yeah, town. The okay. whole town. Okay, we've got a bunch of different answers for this one. We've got in the effort of pool park, the old library, biker, house across from McDonald's, Connell Mansion. You have uh, 10, 10 more seconds for your answer. We have Hans Herr also listed. All right, I think that's, that's a good amount of time. So the answer is
The oldest surviving house in Ephrata is the Eicher Cabin, located right across the creek from the Ephrata Cloister. This house was built in 1733 for sisters Anna and Maria Eicher, two followers of Conrad Beisel, who came with him when he moved here to Ephrata. This house was built for the Eicher sisters by other followers of Beisel, either by the brothers or by married members. The Eicher sisters were the first women to become celibate sisters in Beisel's growing community. In 1735, their father, Daniel Eicher, acquired 100 acres of land from William Penn and moved here to live with his daughters. He built a new house right next to this cabin which today forms the oldest part of the next door Iker Arts Center. The cabin that we see today has been expanded from the 1733 original. Only this stone portion is original. This back section with the window was added later. Okay, so looks like we only got one partially correct answer. Um, anyone like to add on anything else? Any questions? And if not, who, who should be the next person to pick? I also like to mention that all the buildings that everyone's listing are all very old and they're like pretty close, but Iker building beats out all of them. Okay, well, Sue had it, but she just did. Sue, you want to nominate somebody to ask which one? How about Moretta? Okay, um, how about number five? Okay, so where would you find a pair of brick squirrel tails at the cloister? Okay, I'll give it a few more seconds. Okay, so the real answer is Squirrels can be found all over the Ephraim Cloister property, even where they're not wanted. But the most interesting squirrels on the property are here at the bakery, and they're not furry. These brick ovens are known as squirrel tail ovens because of how the smoke channel curves along the back of the dome, resembling a squirrel's bushy tail. So I think some of you got it. Um, who should we pick as the next? You should be able to I, I think Terry Pierce because he specifically said ovens. So we're gonna give that answer to Terry. Terry, you wanna unmute and pick one? Sure. Um how about number four? Sorry. Let's pick that. Number four. I think I think we did number four. 
four from the no, we four. did not. No, do no we didn't do this one. Okay, number four. Okay, oops, oops. Okay, so you all have to match the humors and temperaments. We have blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile, and you must connect them with sanguine, choleric, melancholic, and phlegmatic. We also have a question about the brick scroll ovens. Did that design keep the smoke from affecting the food? Can I answer that one, Michael? Yes, please, because I'm thinking there's no, the beehives work the same way in a sense. Right, so, so the squirrel tail is in essence the chimney for the oven. It funnels the smoke because there's no actual wood or fire in the oven when you're cooking. You're only heating the oven up with a fire till it gets to the temperature you want. So that is acts as the chimney. Once it has reached the temperature that you would like, you simply scrape all the fire out, mop it out to get all the ashes out and then put your uh, baked goods, whatever you're baking inside the oven. You start out with things requiring higher heat. Uh, for a typical household, they're going to fire their oven probably once a week. Uh, the cloister fired, I believe, Michael, you can correct me if I'm wrong, every other day. Um, That's what we think. That's what we think, yes. So um, yeah, so there's actually no fire in there. So the smoke wouldn't have affected, um, but having had bread directly from a beehive oven at Chad's Ford Historical Society, it tastes very good. Okay, so for the answers, I accidentally put, um, I was trying to explain kind of how to, uh, how you should put these. So do it like David did. No, I messed up when I was typing it. Do you have some answers to this question? So we got a few, but like some of them are like not really complete. Yeah, yeah, like that, like that. Right, I'll give everyone like a, 10 more seconds because it does take a little bit to even figure out. Okay, so the answers for the, I guess the, the correct matches are Hello everyone. You have been asked about the four humors and their temperaments. The four humors are melancholic, choleric, phlegmatic, and sanguine. Now, the melancholic personality is said to be a rational person, an introverted thinker who is focused, meticulous, logical, analytical, and detail-oriented. However, much like the name melancholic suggests, it can also be very, very sad. That is because the overwhelming fluid associated with this is black bile. For that reason, it is associated with the spleen, old age, and being cold and dry in terms of your temperament. Now, choleric humor is associated with an artisan who's an extroverted thinker, who's driven, ambitious, headstrong, impatient, and serious because it is most commonly associated with yellow bile, which comes from the gallbladder or is associated with the gallbladder. This refers to a time of childhood and the personality is said to be hot and dry. Phlegmatic personality is said to be a guardian of introverted feeling who's accepting, calm, stable, collected, and harmonizes with those around them. 
For this reason, like the name suggests, it's associated with a phlegm, which comes what they thought from the brain is associated with the mature age and is cold and moist. And the sanguine personality is associated with an idealist who's extroverted feeler, who contains the traits of being charismatic, optimistic, open-minded, explorative, and energetic. For that reason, it's associated with the blood, the heart, the age of adolescence when men is at his most foolhardedly, and hot and moist personality. Now, when it comes to terms of the hot and cold, the cold aspect is said to suppress actions, while the hot personality is said to prompt actions. And these four different humors were the cornerstone of medieval medicine. They thought that whenever you were sick, it's because one of your humors was out of line. For that reason, they would take away blood, try to add blood, stimulate bile, take away bile, add phlegm, get rid of phlegm. It was a whole ordeal. That's why bloodletting and leeches came into style, because if someone was too sanguine, they would try to remove the blood. Or if they weren't enough, they would try to add blood to a person. Now, these four humors and temperaments do not only influence medieval medicine, they also are found in literature. William Shakespeare used these all throughout as different personality types for his characters. Most notably is Romeo and Juliet, where each of the four main male characters is associated with the humor. As you watch them on stage, you see how the different personalities or the stereotypes of them are supposed to interact. Now, the melancholic personality is most commonly associated with Romeo because he is sad and weepy, but also an introverted thinker. He may have sometimes seem extroverted, but he mostly keeps all of his feelings deep inside himself and only shares them with those people that he truly trusts. Well, Tybalt is a cleric. He's extroverted. He is driven, ambitious, almost blood hungry, you might say. And that is associated with an plethora or an abundance of yellow bile. While Benvolio is associated with phlegmatic personality, he's the most mature, the most calm, stable, and collected character in the entire play. Instead of engaging in war, he's trying to make peace between the two houses and prevent duels and anyone from dying. And lastly, Mercutio. He is charismatic, optimistic, and the exact definition of a sanguine personality. So those are the four humors, their temperaments, and their use in William Shakespeare. Well, would anyone like to add on any comments or questions? And if not, we... Um, she go first. David Coughlin has the uh, first complete answer, so I think he had help. But um. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I did help. I, yes, I think he cheated, I, I but we'll help. let him we'll let him have it. <laughs> I did have help, but not from Meg. I had it from uh, from my wife, who was sitting to my left. Um, <laughs> number eight, please. Number eight, Michael. I, I thought I pushed eight. No, it's up. It's up. All right, okay. number eight. Why was Sophia Bauman exhumed from her grave in God's Acre Cemetery at the cloister in 1857? So far, we've got two answers, one from Ben for being seen the next day, 
from Sue Fisher to be buried elsewhere? Anybody else? To be moved to another cemetery, says Linda. To make room for a road, says Terry. Do you think that's enough time? I think so. All right, so the real answer of what happened was So Sophia Bellman died of consumption, and shortly after she passed away, so did her mother, two brothers, and two sisters. So there was some superstitions that there was some unnatural things going on, and according to the newspaper article, it says, the belief was seriously entertained and acted upon that by some hocus-pocus the winding sheet of the corpse had got into her mouth and that by a continued suction, the modus operandi, of which was only known to the spirits, she had actually drawn the other five members of her family after her, and that unless this winding sheet was speedily removed from the mouth of the corpse, she would in like manner cause the premature death of the whole connection. But when they dug her up, they realized that the sheet had worn away, as it usually does underground. All right, so what an interesting story. Um, I think you all got stumped. Um, any other questions, comments? Uh, who should be the the next number picker? I don't even know. Well, nobody got that. nobody got that right, so I well, just ran. I'm let just me gonna... just say, I, I, because I'm sorry, I wasn't able to erase some of these as we normally try. Uh, I'm not even sure which one is or two are left. I think two and three. three. No, I know we've done three. Okay, seven, seven and two. We have a few questions in the chat. Uh, Sorry, didn't wasn't scrolling down there. Consumption is tuberculosis. Somebody asked, "What is consumption?" Consumption is tuberculosis. Who is Sophia Bauman? Sophia Bauman was part of a very large uh, family that were married congregation members or householders in the 18th century. By the time Sophia Bauman died, it actually in, in 1850, I'm not really sure of their connection to the Cloister Church, the German Seventh-day Baptist Church. Many of the family members had, of all the householders had drifted away from the original church by that point in time um, and had been attending other churches. But there are many, many members of the Bauman family buried in the cemetery. So that was sort of the family plot, if you will. I don't know specifically about uh, Sophia if she was still attending the Cloister Church or another church in the neighborhood. And we also have the when did she die? She actually died in 1850. Okay, so what, what numbers do we have left, Michael? Well, I, I... <laughs> I sort of think we've got two, possibly seven and nine. I'm just not sure. I okay. believe we did nine. I could be wrong. Okay. I think six is still yeah. open though. Yeah, I think it's two, six, and seven. Okay, well then pick one. Well, so we did seven, says Jolene. <laughs> yeah, I thought, I thought we did seven. Kathy Glass, how about you? How about you unmute yourself and pick one? Two and six. Or someone just type a number in the chat. Quick, pick someone, pick something. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy's going to do something for us. Yeah. Uh, I'll say number two. All right. Now, I thought we did two. Oh, no, we did two. All right, hang on. I just got to oh. <laughs> kind of go around the loop to get back. And I sort of think we, I sort of think we may be at the end. Uh, wait, check six. Can we do that one? 
Yeah, I sort of think we did all these. All right, uh, there's one question that we prepared that was not seen here somewhere. All right, well, we've so got- So I think we might be having the, the same extras. issue we had earlier where it wasn't- It's not in the extras? I mean, we do five. Uh, no, because the question I'm thinking of is the uh, the coffin question. Oh, you you are so right. I am so sorry. Okay, I'm going to go directly to it because we need to do this one yet. Wes, you want to read that one for us? All right. So, what kind of coffin? would you set on your dining room table? So far, the answers we have coming in are a small one, a meat pie in a crust, an empty one, also another empty one. And then I like Terry's answer. I agree with him. One that you're not in. Okay, so the real answer is. Oh, oh, of course. I'm so sorry, folks. Can't believe this. There we go. The pies of the 16th through the 18th centuries are the ancestors of the modern English meat pie. Unlike modern pies of any kind, however, the, the, the stiff hot water pastry crust was more a storage container than anything else. These pastry boxes, or coffins as they were called, were used to preserve the flavor and freshness of the game meats baked inside them and hold the leftovers overnight until they were served for breakfast. And with that, I think we may have gotten all these 10 questions. What do y'all think? Exactly eight o'clock. All right. I'm gonna sort of lead the end of our evening together by putting in a little commercial. And part of the reason why the students wanted to do this this evening was to share with you and all the possible people beyond you uh, the story of the student historians. These are high school students who volunteer their time at the effort of Cloister. We do all sorts of things. The lantern tours I mentioned right at the start is a big activity for the student historians, but they're also involved in doing things like tonight's program. Uh, we, they learn about local history, about the effort of cloister. They serve as uh, hosts and guides in some of the historic buildings when it's possible. Uh, they are on the site involved in many of the programs we are able to present to visitors throughout the year. You do need to be 14 years or older to join the student historians. And if you or anybody you know, uh, a child, a grandchild, a neighbor who might have an interest in things like this, please have them contact us. Um, I put my, my name and phone number and uh, email down at the bottom here. And I really hope you'll consider spreading the word about the student historians. We have a lot of treasures at the Effort of Cloister, physical treasures, but we also have live treasures. Many of you in the audience know that you are, as volunteers, live treasures, and the students are volunteers who I consider some of the real superstar treasures. And it's always a pleasure to work with them. It's a pleasure to have been having you with us this evening. Thank you so much for your patience, your cooperation, and for your attendance this evening. Have a great evening, everybody.
Thank you, Michael, very much. And thank you everyone for your, uh, for hanging with us here through the technical glitches, as Michael right. said in the beginning, this is all a learning curve and, and um, we've all learned a little bit more tonight as it is. I want to remind you that our next virtual academy program will be May 13th. And Michael will be doing a program uh, that will investigate the works printed at Effort a Cloister for other people and organizations called At His Request Put Into Print, Customers of the Press and Puzzles of Printing at Effort a Cloister. I have one other announcement that I would like to make tonight as well. I'm happy to announce if you haven't heard already that the cloister will be reopening to the public uh, beginning April 30th. Our hours of operation will be Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Tours will be by appointment only and we'll begin taking uh, those appointments April 21st. Tours will run on the half hour from 10.30 to 3.30. Um, there will also be self-guided tour options available as well. Masks will be required and there will be uh, capacity limitations for the visitor center and the museum store. But we are so excited to go back to the site and welcome you there in person once again. Um, do know we are planning to continue with our virtual programming the second Thursday of the month, even though we are open to the public. And we look forward to seeing all of you either in person or on Zoom in May. Thank you all and have a good evening. <laughs>